13, Revelation chapter 13. Of course, that means we have covered to some degree uh, chapters 1 through 12. Very important because as we get to chapter 13, we're really here at the battle. Very important. As we look through Revelation, of course, we have our rules of interpretation. This is where all the interpretations start to just start getting made up. Remember, Revelation chapter 22 is very explicit, one of the at least two times in Scripture that a book says explicitly, do not add to, do not take away from this book. That's in Revelation. Surprisingly, or should I say not surprisingly, God knew to add a warning in the book that man would just run full bore with and make up different interpretations. That's not what we're going to do, of course, as we say this. And so how do we make sure that we are being true to the text? Number one, make sure it means something to the original audience. It has to mean something to first century Christians. We've used a bunch of examples of texts that you can easily buy on Amazon at Barnes & Noble that do not fit that description. Number two must not create conflict with other scripture. Just like any other book of the Bible, if we reach a conclusion on what the literal or figurative language means, and it finds itself in opposition to other clear text, that can't be. And then the third part is it will keep with primary themes. Very important to look with me at the theme verse today. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14. You notice in chapters 11 and 12, we're starting to see words like war and conquering and those with the Lamb. Chapter 17, verse 14, we've said the whole time, is the theme of Revelation. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Every level of verse 14 is what Revelation is about. First of all, there will be war, and there will be war between the Lamb and those on the other side. And of course, who will win? The Lamb will conquer them. That conquering is an interesting word because conquer doesn't mean you've won every single battle. It means you've won what we would call the war. And that's, of course, what verse 14 says. There will be a war, which means there are all sorts of battles. That make, that's tough for us as Christians to understand Jesus not just winning 100% of the battles or choosing to participate in 100% of the battles, however you view that. But nonetheless, that's part of war. The Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. We've seen in Revelation as God's judgment comes down on mankind, not only do the poor and the small suffer if they are sinful, but who else? The kings, the wealthy, the rich. Jesus is the one who will stand, Lord of lords and King of kings. And of course, the question is, what side are we on? Those with them are called and chosen and faithful. What we're going to see is we are here at the war. In chapter 12, we call it Satan is the biggest loser. There are three battles. What is the first battle in Revelation chapter 12? Hence, it's not on the screen. It is not on the screen. Revelation 12, in the first few verses, what is the first battle that Satan loses? Okay. Uh, he is going to be fighting in heaven. We're going to see that in verse 7 through 12, and even to some extent with God and his plan. But what is the specific idea of the signs and symbols in chapter 12? Who is Satan coming for? He's coming for a male child. Of course, this is where you get to the heavenly point from CV in verse 5. One who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Who is the enemy in chapter 12? Well, I already said it's Satan, but notice verse 3. Very important for our lesson today. Verse 3 as well as verse 9. Verse 3. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. He sought for the child. He did not get the child. Who intervened? God. God also prepared a place for the woman. You see that in verse 6. Who is the great dragon in verse 9? The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. He, the deceiver of the whole world, was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Why were they thrown down to the earth? Because they battled, verse 7 and 8, in heaven with the angels. And did Satan win there? No, when you're the greatest loser, you don't win these battles. And so, he has lost trying to get the child. He has lost in heaven. So now where does he go? Down to earth. Verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. Very important phrase in here. Woe to you who in verse 12. What two bodies? Earth and sea. We're going to see that in a minute. We're going to see all these themes coming out. Conquering, war, lamb, king of kings, earth and sea. And then, of course, verse 13. When the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. There's our three and a half we've seen over and again. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. 
Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. Who are her offspring? Those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Satan has lost going for the child. It is Jesus. You see that fulfilled with Herod trying to wipe out all the kids. Jesus was not killed in Matthew chapter 2. He then has this fight in heaven. He loses there. Now he's coming down to earth, and specifically, he is coming in verse 17 for Christians. What does that look like? How and why? And why? Back to our theme verse in Revelation 17 and verse 14. Would anyone not just choose the King of kings and Lord of lords? Why would no one just be with the winning side? Who would pick the greatest loser? Chapter 13 and 14 help us understand some of the ugly parts of war and why people make these bad choices. Read with me in chapter 13. If someone will please read for me verse 1 through 4. Chapter 13, verse 1 through 4. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, and ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? Okay, so we recall in chapter 12, woe to what two bodies again? The earth and sea. Where does this beast come from in verse 1? Out of the sea. And if you look at verse 11, there's going to be a second beast. This is going to help us identify them. In verse 11, then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. All right, so we're talking about this first beast or the sea beast. The word beast is used repetitively, but we're going to try to be consistent. I'm sure I will slip up and mess that up. But the first beast, according to verse 1, would be the sea beast. And the second beast in verse 11 would be the earth beast. But before we look at all of the beast language, where have we seen this description of the beast with the ten horns before? Where have we seen the ten horns and the seven heads? Where has that exact description been found? Chapter 12 with the dragon. Okay, chapter 12 with the dragon. Now that's important because what does that tell us about the beast? Whose side is he going to be on? Satan. Yeah, this is going to be pretty easy. Now, we're, some of these questions with the symbolism are easy, but they're going to help us get to the hard part, which is interpreting what do we do with it. But you look at this, you say, okay, well, what about the ten horns? What about the seven heads? What are we supposed to do with that description? What, are the, what is the symbolism of the horns? We don't do this too often, but I do think because it is repeated, we should look at these. Ten horns. Remember, first century language has to mean something to the Christians then. has to mean something to the same in chapter 12 as chapter 13. Consistency demands that. Yeah, yeah, horns often in the first century and even before especially had to do with battle and with power and strength. So you look at this, you have ten horns, that would be a complete amount, a full amount of power. Do we see that backed up? Yes. At the end of verse 4, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? This beast would be powerful and effective. Seven is that idea of perfect. We looked at three and a half in chapter 12. Over and again, God was saving the woman, saving the child. And often you see time, times, and half a time, three and a half. 1,260 days, that's three and a half years. 42 months also, three and a half years. Three and a half again, that, that one thing we want to do with three and a half. Engineers, please be quiet. When you think about the three and a half, what do you do with that? You just want to make it seven, right? It's half. It's not the perfect amount. But this is seven heads. That's a bit concerning, isn't it, Richard? I've always come to understand that that means seven heads refer to the emperors of Rome. And the ten horns refer to the king. Yeah, very well, very well could be those. I think we're going to see more of that as we get towards the end of the battle. Yeah, because it all fits into that scenario. However, it probably has a broader meaning. Yes, and that's why for our class we're largely going to stay away from which kingdom, which vassal kingdom, although there's a lot of merit to that worldview. And there's also, by the way, again, the discussion, if you date Revelation earlier, it's going to be more Jerusalem-based. If you date it later, it's going to be a little more Rome-based. I believe it's a little more Rome-based. We're not going to get into that because either way, you see who is in charge of this beast. The dragon is. So the takeaway is clear. There is going to be some sort of kingdom on earth flexing great power and strength. And when you think about the seven heads, you carry the idea of wisdom, 
You carry the idea of which is cunning and skillful. And is this beast cunning and skillful? Well, you look at verse 2. The beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And of course, again, the dragon gave its power and its throne and great authority. What power did the beast possess? We know the power source is the dragon. But from the descriptions that we have, whether it be the horns or in verse 2, or even some of the descriptions in verse 3, what are some of the powers that this beast possessed? The ability to get people to marvel at it and follow him. Okay. Yeah, one of them in number 4, they worshipped the dragon, for they, he had given his authority to the beast. So whatever he did, he was an effective messenger. And by the way, he was a messenger for who? Satan. We've seen this in Revelation 12 and verse 9. Please know the dragon and Satan are the same. I'm going to mix those up all class. So just again, Satan, dragon, Satan. Okay, what else? What else do we know about the power of this beast? What, what is it effective at? Deception. Okay, it is a master at deception. I think you do see some of that, by the way, with the heads. But even in verse 2, the beast that I saw was like a leopard's feet like a bear's and its mouth like a lion's mouth. All of these are radiating what in addition to the aforementioned characteristics? Terror. Frightful power. And again, we're starting to say, why would anyone ever join the losing side? Why wouldn't everyone just pick the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? This is so easy. Not when the beast is a master at deception, when he's a master at showing terrible power. Christy? These kind of animals are also predators. Absolutely. All of them are ferocious beasts and animals and have different skill sets. A leopard moves differently than a bear. But again, you think about the beast and you say, okay, well... I understand why people respond this way, but why would so many marvel at the dragon because of this? I think Brian's comment already hinted at this. Why would so many people marvel? At the end of verse 3, the whole earth marvels as they follow the beast. What happened in verse 3 that we haven't touched on yet? A seeming resurrection. A sort of a resurrection. Now, we've seen this before in Revelation chapter 11. Remember, I said... It's all going to hit ahead in chapters 13 through 19 when the war is here. All the really easy parts that we've been studying the whole time are all crashing in. In chapter 11, who does God send? There's two of them. Two, what's the word for them? Two witnesses. And they're going to teach everybody. And how does the world receive the two witnesses? Everyone loves the beast. How do they respond to God's two powerful witnesses? They hate them. And they kill them. And they celebrate. And they, what we might call literally dancing on their graves. But what happens to the witnesses that shocks and terrifies the masses? They come back. They were brought back. And then there is judgment. Then you see in chapter 13, it's interesting then, in chapter 13, that this beast has the seeming power to have a resurrection type. What does that teach us about the power that this beast possesses? Not only is it great in strength, but what else can it do? Yeah, it is self-healing. It looks like it is sustainable. No one wants to back a loser, right? Well, here's a ferocious beast who, even when it gets injured, manages to do what, at least on the surface? Pick up and keep on moving along. Nothing can take us down, right? You usually meet two types of people politically. There's either the type of person who believes the sky has already fallen, it, it's falling, but it's already crashed and we're irredeemable. And you meet the other side who says, you know, there, nothing really changes. You know, the, the people in Washington, D.C. change, the people in Montgomery, that's our capital, right? In Montgomery here in the state. They, ch they change, but it's all the same. Well, sometimes it feels like that, doesn't it? It feels like nothing I do matters. This country can't sink. We're too strong, too powerful, too mighty. Do you think Jews ever thought that about Jerusalem with the temple? The Old Testament reports that they did. Do we think Rome ever thought that? Boy, did Rome think that. There is all kinds of historical documentation from every sort of source that Rome would be this impenetrable force of a kingdom. So you say, why would someone give in to this? Well, we start to see. If someone please read verse 5 through 8. 5 through 8. There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words of blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with his saints and to overcome them in authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name So now we see a little bit more of why people might be drawn to this beast. First of all, you have that deception, as the word Brian threw out earlier, verse 5, a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. Why? Who is the dragon's enemy? This is stated chapter 12 and verse 17. Who is he coming for? 
In, in essence, God, but specifically in verse 17, who is named? The offspring of woman. That is Christians, those who follow the teaching of Jesus. That's the only body of Christians. That's the only definition that will ever work. Those who teach and follow after the teachings of Jesus. And so he's making war with God and God's people. How long is he allowed to exercise authority? There's our number again. 42 months, three and a half. So despite his strong and impressive power, despite all these characteristics, and despite all that it seems, how long is its reign going to be? An imperfect and ending amount of time. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Now, again, you see the, the inverse of our theme verse, chapter 17, verse 14. They, the enemies, will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will what? The Lamb will conquer them. Notice what this beast can do in verse 7. It was allowed to make war on the saints. I love the English Standard Version here. And to conquer them. The beast is going to win. And this is going to be uncomfortable. We're going to really get into this. And as a first century Christian, what are you supposed to do with this information about this great beast? But who is the beast coming for explicitly in chapter 13? We know who the dragon's coming for. We know the dragon is the power source of the beast. Who is this beast coming for? The sea beast. Saints. Christians. Is it going to be successful? I heard a couple of answers. I think they were all right, but I, I need to distinguish them. Hey, look. Yeah. And on this earth, he will be temporarily. And that's the key. Where is this battle happening, this round? We saw Satan lose three different rounds. He was chasing the sun. He lost. He went into heaven. He lost. Now he's on earth. Right? It's going to seem like a victory. Rebecca, you said something as well, I think. Um, I just say it's okay. For a time. Okay, for a time. In fact, we've seen that listed in verse 5. But I do think we need to embrace wholeheartedly the idea that this conquering is true. The Bible scripture, the same scripture that teaches Jesus is Lord of Lords and Kings of Kings, says that whoever this sea beast is will absolutely conquer the saints. How would it do that? is to give the idea that it is in complete control. That sovereignty rests in leadership or in a kingdom's power. This beast gives the idea with its ten horns, seven heads, and ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous <coughs> names on its heads, that it can stand in the place of God. And it looks like that because of its ferociousness. It looks like that because of its early victories. But what do we know as Christians? What would the first century Christians reading Revelation know? Chapter 4 and 5 is all about God who is situated where? On his throne. And what are people doing every time they see God in Revelation? Every single time they are worshiping. Why? Because he is the one who is actually in control. Bill. The whole book, Romans, chapter 8, the last part of the chapter, the language is pretty similar to this. We're, we put to death all day long, we're like sheep to the slaughter. And yet, in all this, he says, we're more than conquerors. So there's the same picture. There's what appears to be a temporary defeat. It looks as though. And being in the middle of the battle is a key point here as we look at this, because it, it, killing is ter terrible and terrifying, especially if you expand Revelation again out to that later date. Some of the actual ways of killing Christians were, at best, horrific. At best. However, let's also be realistic, and we're going to see this with the second beast in particular, there's more to terrorizing people than just killing some of them. That is awful. That is horrendous. But there has to be a more effective tool because some people are going to say it's just not going to hit us. Or, all right, you can get one one hundredth of us, but the 99% are going to keep multiplying. That's what the first century church was doing, wasn't it? So there has to be more tools in the toolbox. Satan knows that because he wants to get to God. And so as we keep looking through this, we say, okay, well, how is this beast going to be successful? What are some of its other tools? What else can it do? 
to persecute Christians? How can it make God's people switch sides or give up? What is this beast's goal? To get people to worship the dragon. How is it going to do that besides threats of murder? That's a strong motivator. I don't like to die. But besides that, what other tools might it use? Fear. Fear. Oppression. Okay, by the way, do you think before the death that they treated Christians really well and then they lit them on fire in the streets? No, there would be torture. Every avenue of this would be torturous. Now, by the way, as we remember this morning, as we should every Lord's Day, Jesus was tortured. And he was blameless and innocent. New Testament, other books, the other 26 books of the New Testament, are full of examples of teaching us that we are to be like Jesus. And if Jesus suffered and was persecuted, what should we expect as his followers? To suffer and be persecuted as well. That's part of the game plan. That's part of looking at a bigger picture. The problem is the Christians, just like us, are living in a certain day and time. And so as we process this, we say, okay, if you're a first century Christian, how do you dwell with the idea that your brothers and sisters, your mom, your dad, your son, your daughter, is going to be one of the ones lit on fire? Your family are going to be one of the ones imprisoned or tortured. You are going to be imprisoned or tortured. Why isn't God doing anything about this? How do we process the idea that this beast will be successful on any level you want? Call it just earth. Call it a temporary victory. A temporary victory is still a victory. It's not a final victory. I understand that. Winning a battle doesn't mean you win the war. I understand that. But how do we as Christians, in particular, how do the first century Christians process the idea that in the midst of the war that God could end with the snap of his fingers or even just the words from his voice, that any Christian has to die, suffer, or be tortured? How would they or we understand that? Faith. Faith. How so? Well, to know that there's something other than this world, and even though it may be really, really rotten, what happens to you, that if you have faith in it and you endure, that you will be rewarded by God. Okay, so first of all, I need to know as an individual, or even on behalf of my family, that this isn't it. Right? There is a bigger picture on the back end. Absolutely. Isn't that the point of the story? Right? Because these Christians are going to go through this, and it is terrible. Um, and, and, and I think God understands that they may not get the answer to that question right off. So he, he, the Holy Spirit writes this book to show you look like you're being completely defeated, and I've left you alone. Uh, right. We need to remember God has not left us alone. By the way, it, who is doing this? This is a part of chapter 13 that is pivotal. Who is behind this suffering? The dragon, Satan, and the beast, by the way. So who is the enemy? Satan and the beast. One thing that's hard. Now, could God stop it? Yes, he has that power. But the one doing the suffering, doing the torturing, is still the bad guy. Yeah, so again, it's kind of like what Christy was saying. We have this choice to make. Which picture are we looking at? One of the biggest struggles on a day-to-day basis is trying to take yourself out of the day, isn't it? We get so caught up in what's going wrong today or this week, maybe this month, but it's usually much uh, closer than that. And we get preoccupied with it. We get stuck. But what is Paul saying? Colossians 3, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Richard. Thousands, millions of people that have followed after him 
again, you're considering that the facsimile of power this beast is showing are false premises of what God has done. Jesus was resurrected. This beast seems like it has healed itself. God is all-powerful. This beast seems like it is strong. Robert, then Brian, then we're going to move to the next one. Yeah, one of the toughest passages to understand as a young person for me was James. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials and tribulations. And, 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 but as we get older, we understand that going through these, that fire purifies us and makes our faith stronger. And I think that's perfectly seen here. They didn't see it either. Uh, maybe, but uh, it, it happens. Yeah, and by the way, I think that last sentence too is pivotal. Sometimes we don't understand. Sometimes there isn't an answer. I think Revelation is giving the answer that God is in control throughout and God will win throughout. I don't know. I don't know that Revelation even provides an answer as to why does God let the beast do this. But one thing we do know, just like every time in Scripture it seems like evil will win, it's only for what? A short period of time. It was allowed at the end of verse 5 to exercise authority for its 42 months. Right. Especially remembering that we need the redemption of that little slain lamb as opposed to being the lamb that was slain. It's a quite remarkable contrast. If someone please read verse 11 through 18. That's the end of the chapter and then we'll, we'll kind of go through this. 11 through 18. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and, and spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven uh, to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had, had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as, as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small, the great, the rich, and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Okay, before we get into the sea beast itself, or excuse me, the earth beast, uh, one more question about the sea beast. How effective was it, going back to verse 3 and 4, in bringing attention and glory, quote unquote, to the dragon? How effective was it? Incredibly, verse 3 describes the whole earth marveled. Verse 4, they worshipped the dragon. Now, when we get to this earth beast, notice in verse 12, it exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. So lest anyone have made it through, in case terrorizing, in case the power of the empire isn't strong enough to twist everyone to follow... Who is going to clean up the mess? The second beast. So the first one is so ferocious that the whole earth is described as marveling. Then there's another beast with a, essentially just as much power. And it works as a spokesman for the first beast to get the 1% that made it through. Now we're starting to see at the end of chapter 13, why would anyone choose the other side from the land? Okay, so what are, what are some of the sea beast differences? What about how it looks? What's the difference in the sea beast, both literally in the text, and what do we do with that information? It looks like a lot of animals. 
Okay, this one has the power, it talks like a dragon, but what does it have horns like? A lamb. Now we've seen that lamb, obviously, the lamb is Jesus, Revelation 17, verse 14. The lamb is Jesus, but a lamb is what to people? It's a war animal, right? The one you're going to ride into victory? Not exactly. It's more of what we call cannon fodder. All right, so it looks like lamb. What's the impact? What's the, if there is a good part of looking like a lamb, what would it be? Yeah, it makes us think of the wolves in sheep's clothing. Right, the idea, it seems innocent. Seems simple. Seems okay. I do think that's an important description because later we're going to get to the control of finances. And we view that as, oh, the empire is raining down. That's true. The empire does rain down. The empire does tighten the screws on finances. It also makes us make little compromises. You know, a little lamb is kind of like that essence, the, the, cho the choice to do a white lie. More people will tell a white lie than a normal lie, right? We hear that language all the time. Why? It doesn't seem like it's that dangerous. This beast doesn't look like it's as dangerous at the first, but it's absolutely just as deadly. Elizabeth? Um, I may be completely off base here, but every time I think you talk about the beast and everything, all I can think about is how Satan does such a good job at creating distraction within our lives, and that's essentially what's you know, kind of going on here. Um, and if you look at Genesis, um, the first reading of Genesis, well, not the first book, but um, when he talks to Eve, or when Jesus talks to Yeah, that's a great terminology. And of course, when was the turning point in Genesis 3? The woman saw that it was good for food, right? She was looking at the very thing she wasn't supposed to be near. Right? That's a great point. Phil? There's a lot of places you can go with this. The one that occurs to me kind of along the line of what Elizabeth just said. The power of the first beast is through force, intimidation, uh, sheer terror. People are, are getting into the first beast because they live in terror of the first beast. The power of the second beast. From a stranglehold of power, the first beast is affected, but anyone who would get through that, now you have what I'd call more day-to-day -day life, or even a cultural impact from the second beast. Elizabeth? Yeah, I, when, um, when Bill was just talking, I was just thinking about, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the movie The Bedazzled. Um, it's just such a great um, documentary about the Bedazzled, and it's kind of like the Bedazzled Church, and it's just a Yeah, and that's what these first century Christians are being told. I think that's exactly the point of chapter 13. We have to look past that. Christy talked about faith. Clark has spoken about following the Lamb. We have to be willing to see past what looks like an amazing sign in verse 13. It performs great signs, making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. Who is, who is this beast targeting? Who is he coming for? The rest of the earth. Yeah, basically everyone. <laughs> In verse 16, it causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. What is the purpose of the marking? Right? What is the purpose of the marking? Cancel. <laughs> right? Cancel. 
right? Specifically in verse 17, if you have the mark, what are you unable to do? Or if you don't have the mark, what are you unable to do? You can't buy it yourself. You can't do anything. You're gone. As Bill, as Bill used the phrase, cancel culture. Now, you're a first century Christian, and you've just read how ferocious the first beast is, and we're going to die, we're going to be lit on fire, we're going to be tortured, thrown apart by another lion's den. And now you're a first century Christian, you're like, okay, well, I have enough faith to get through knowing that even if my body is ripped to shreds, it's fine, but what is my day-to-day -day life like now? Miserable. It, and just a quick side note, chapter 13, I do think it's very important to see this as the later date in, in Revelation because Rome is the only entity in the first century that would have had this kind of power. Jerusalem was not able to do these types of things. I do not believe that. We can talk about that privately. But the way that Rome, if you accept that premise, the way that Rome could put the screws on its citizens is in every facet of life. It could literally control the ability to buy and sell. And so now, not only are you a Christian just trying to not get caught and die, you can't even survive to hide. Can we say that would be pretty depressing? If you're a first century Christian, just someone tell me, I know everyone in the room is not an astute optimist, okay? And don't make me ask the question, who's an optimist, who's sitting next to a pessimist, because more hands will go up the second time. Right? Someone in here is a pessimist. When you're reading chapter 13, what, I want to hear from a pessimist or someone pretending to be a pessimist to give you some cover fire. What are you thinking here when you read this in chapter 13? Okay. <laughs> What's the point? All right, wow, we went straight off the cliff to pessimism. That's good. Okay, all right. I was kind of inching along, but wow, we, we jumped. Okay. But that, it's true, though, because you look at that and you say, okay, well, what is the point in me keeping on, keeping on? Notice the, the verses we skipped over in verse 9 and 10. In between the two beasts, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he, must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Say this a million times in our Revelation study. Why do you need endurance? Because something is going to be incredibly challenging and difficult. You need endurance when you're on the edge of giving up. Giving up is meaning all is lost. We are over the waterfall. What's the point? I can't eat or drink to even worship God on Sunday and hide my family. I can't provide for my kids who, thank goodness, are not being lit on fire at the moment. But I can't keep them alive. What hope do they have? This is only getting worse. This would be depressing. As a Christian, though, what, what are you taking from chapter 13 on the optimistic side? From chapter 13, I know there's a lot of great messages throughout the scripture that answer this. I know from chapter 13, what are Christians taking from this to help us? Hope. Where's the hope coming from? I agree. Where's the hope coming from in chapter 13? Okay, there's promises that there's something worth hanging on for. Right? Absolutely. Verse 18, this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for his number of man, and his number is 666. Of course, there's that number. Uh, every good Christian knows if this total comes up in the store, you've got to buy another chocolate bar or something. Can't have that. This is what it's about. What is the number about, by the way? What, what, what specifically in verse 18 before we talk about what it means? Okay, it's the number of man. Uh, how does the number of man fit into this discussion of the earth beast? Yes, and we've seen that, right? Whoa, whoa, whoa. And of course, chapter 12, who is the dragon coming for? Earth and sea. What, what beast have we seen? The sea beast and the earth beast. Man has to choose. Six falls just short of what? Seven. Seven. Just short. Not there. Not complete. Not done. Bill. Right in the middle of the description of the two beasts. First half of the chapter. Second half of the chapter. Verses 8. There is an end point to what they can do, and there will be a judgment for them. By the way, Revelation teaches that. Not only do good win and bad lose, you see what happens to those who choose the beasts or the dragon. But do key in on verse 8, as Bill drew attention to, 
everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Those are the ones who are going to have uh, submission to that first beast. But notice the book of life. I, I, that phrase, we, we hear that so much, we're, we're used to it. But as a first century Christian, when you're fearing death, what does it mean to be in the book of life? It means everything. That is how you get the perspective. That's what you're remembering. And by the way, what we're going to see in the next few chapters is the idea you have to choose a mark. You have to choose a mark of some kind. And this is where it's difficult. You choose the mark of the beast and make your life easy. Make no mistake, taking the mark of the beast would be a good choice short term. Okay, We don't say that a lot as Christians because we don't want to touch it. I understand we need to abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. The devil makes some things really good, quote unquote, and easy from an earthly, temporal point of view. Call a spade a spade. Wouldn't it be much easier and better to have no problems with the culture, to have no problems with Rome, to not fear for your life, and to be able to buy, sell, and trade as much as you want? And, by the way, buy, sell, and trade, and pick up the slack where other people who aren't submitting to Rome and now have to give up their fortune to you? Wouldn't that be better, at least for a week or a day? Yes. Otherwise, there's no appeal. This is the appeal. Choose an easier life. This is the temptation of Satan to Jesus directly. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 4, there were three temptations. Turn the rock to stone, of course, and then he talks about jumping off the edge. But what was the final temptation in Matthew 4? If you'll just what? Kneel. Fall down and worship me, and everything you see will be yours. Now, I've, I've thought about that a million times. I think Jesus already has everything. He created everything. We see that in Colossians chapter 1. But I think the temptation, this could be wrong, I think the temptation was this is a shortcut. You can have all the riches of being king of kings and lord of lords without being crucified, without suffering. This is the choice. As Christians, the first century Christians would learn what we need to embrace, that there is no middle ground. You choose the mark of the beast, ally yourself with Satan, and enjoy the fruits of that. Or you wear the mark of God and enjoy the fruits of that, as well as the cons to both. If you choose Satan's side, hell is waiting for you, Revelation chapter 20. But if you choose Christ's side, there's going to be some pain and some conquering from that first beast in the interim. As we think about chapter 14, we're going to see a bit of a transition. If someone please read verse 1 through 5. Chapter 14, verse 1 through 5. seen the 144,000 before? What's that? Well, uh, right before we see the multitudes around the throne, right? We see in chapter 7 these two groups. Now we're going to see them there. Uh, you see them in chapter 7, and they're being sealed right before what's going to happen to the earth. Right before judgment comes, God's going to see all those who are his. The 12, so you think of the 12,000 from each tribe, 12,000 times 12. We see the perfect, complete fullness of God's people. In verses 9 and 10, you saw a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, tribes, people's languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, crying out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The 144,000 now, though, are here. And where are they? With the Lamb. Now they are with Christ. And who are these 144,000? We know they're from chapter 7. But verse 3 says they had been redeemed from the earth. And verse 5 is interesting. Their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Were these perfect folks that were saved? Why? I understand 144,000 is not literal. We're saying the complete number of God's people granted. Were they blameless as in perfect? Always. How do we know that? Right? A key word here, very critical, in verse 4, 
These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. Very important. That says, number one, God is going to pick people who are not perfect. He is going to redeem us. Who does the redeeming? The Lamb. Jesus. This goes back to John. Remember, John is weeping because no one could what? In heaven. No one could open the scroll, and yet who came? Who was able to? The lion from the tribe of Judah, that is, the lamb that looked as if it had been slain. It had been. Jesus is the key to everything. Now, what do we take from this? Number one, God knows who his people are. Number two, God picks flawed people. In this battle, God's not just picking the strongest soldiers. He's not looking for Samson's strength. He's looking for what in chapter 13? Faith and endurance. God does the rest. God had an angel seal the 144,000 so that they would not answer in the judgment. Those whose names are in the book of life would withstand in eternity. You see that in chapter 20 and 21. No matter what the beasts do in chapter 13. And so we understand the 144,000 are God's chosen on the basis of faith and endurance. And so when we think about the 144,000, we already talked, they are with the Lamb. What is the significance of this relative to the backdrop of the war going on in chapter 13? The fact that the 144,000 are with the Lamb on Mount Zion. What do we take with those two ideas? Mount Zion and Lamb are our cues. They're safe. They are delivered. We saw in chapter 7 they would be saved. Then we saw the carnage. Now we're seeing they made it. As a first century Christian, this is everything. Not only is God in control, not only is he promising, and God is faithful to his promises, this is proof. Chapter 7, before the judgments, I'm going to mark the 144,000, sealed with the mark of God on their forehead. Then judgment and destruction. Have we seen it? One third of the earth went down. One third of the rivers. One third of the sky. War in heaven and on earth. All this happens, and did God keep his promise? Yes. You see it not just in the scripture. That's a powerful testimony. You see it in Revelation. God keeps his promises even when the carnage is horrific. Even when you can't buy or sell. Even when you can't eat. Even when people you know and love are being tortured to death. God is there. He knows who you are by name. And he's going to keep his promise to you. You've got to remember that. Satan wants us. This is an aside that Revelation teaches. Okay? Satan wants every person in this room to forget, not only about the end, but to forget in the now that God cares about. He wants you to think about how difficult it is and how much easier it would be to compromise just once, to give in to the earth beast. We know the sea beast is terrifying. I think a lot of Christians would easily stand up with their life on the line to believe in Jesus. I think it's much more difficult to have the endurance against the earth beast to make the right decisions and not compromise faith day after day after day. Satan wants you to think he can't. He wants you to think God isn't there for you. If, if he was, he would do something, wouldn't he? But Revelation's not about that at all. God is letting this happen. Why? Because of free will. He's not sending the dragon to do this. The dragon is choosing to do this because the dragon is furious with God. We saw that chapter 12, verse 17. Haley. Absolutely. And not focus on what your Lord can do for you. Well, I mean, powerfully stated, and again, the idea that we're redeemed. Satan wants us to be convinced, I am irredeemable. This can't work, this won't work. That is a lie. Who is the great dragon? He is the deceiver of, of old. As Jesus would say, he's the father of lies. Uh, one final point here, verse 6 through 8. 
Who receives these messages? Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Who is this message for? Verse 6. Everyone, those who dwell on the earth, every nation and tribe and language and people. Very important. Go back to chapter 13 and verse 7. Who is the first beast, as we would use the phrase loosely, ministering to? And it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given to it over every tribe and people and language and nation. <clears throat> to Haley's point from before, there are loud messages everywhere. You can't win. You can't do it. It's going to be a pain. You're going to get your family killed. You're going to separate. You're going to be a problem. You can't do it. And what is God sending? A message the whole time. You can. You can choose me. Fear God. Be ready. Judgment is coming. Choose the right side. I'm going to pick up with chapter 14 through 16. Lord willing, next Sunday, chapter 15 is pretty short. We're going to try to do chapter 14, the rest of it, through chapter 16 next Sunday morning.